Hey everyone, Khalid here. Welcome back to Clinical Physio. In today's video, we're going to take you through the key muscles that flex the shoulder at the glenohumeral joint. If you like learning anatomy from us, please be sure to smash that like button. And otherwise, let's dive in with today's video. So the first muscle that we're going to show you involved in shoulder flexion is the deltoid muscle. So the deltoid muscle has a number of different origin points, including the clavicle anteriorly, the acromion in the middle, and the spine of scapula posteriorly. And if we look at the deltoid from this view, we can see where these anterior fibers originate from the clavicle, the middle fibers originate from the acromion, and the posterior fibers originate from the spine of the scapula. And in fact, it's important to think of the deltoid muscle in those three different groups, anterior, middle, and posterior fibers, when it comes to their roles. So all of these fibers originate from those various points before they come together and insert into the lateral humerus at the deltoid tuberosity. And the deltoid tuberosity is around a third or a quarter of the way down the lateral aspect of the humerus. So when we think about the role of the ACJ, we can think of it in terms of its fibres. We mentioned the anterior, middle and posterior fibres, and we can see that the anterior fibres in particular have a role in shoulder flexion. Now, the deltoid is mainly thought of as an abductor, of the arm, and of course that is the case. But we can also think of those anterior fibers having a little bit more of a bias towards shoulder flexion, which is why they're so crucial to mention in this group. So the next muscle to mention, a really important muscle in the context of shoulder flexion, is pectoralis major, a really important muscle in this group. So once again, this muscle has a large number of different origin points, which we can see here. So it has origins from the medial half of the clavicle, as well as the anterior surface of the sternum and the costal cartilages of ribs one to seven, as you can see here. Now, when we think of pectoralis major, it's sometimes split into two different parts. It has a clavicular part and a sternocostal part. We can see that the sternocostal part originates mainly from the sternum and the different costal cartilages we saw a second ago. And the clavicular part originates from the clavicle. And actually, we can see that the clavicular part is what runs down from the clavicle towards the humerus this way. And therefore, you can imagine that when we want to flex the shoulder, it's going to be this clavicular part, which is more active, which originates from the medial aspect of the clavicle. So then all the fibers from those two parts join together and insert into the proximal humerus, in particular on the lateral aspect of the intertubercular groove. We can see a little groove here, which is where the long head of biceps tendon runs in. It's sometimes called the bicipital groove for this reason too. And we can see that the pectoralis major inserts into the lateral aspect or the lateral lip of that groove. So once again, this muscle has a major role in flexion of the humerus. It also has roles in adduction, as you can imagine, from the fact that it will draw the fibers in towards the sternum, meaning it will pull the humerus in an adduction position. And it also is suggested to have an element of a role in medial rotation. But we can definitely think of that clavicular portion that has a role in flexion of the shoulder in a really important way, particularly because it's such a powerful muscle. And therefore, when we really want to lift the shoulder with power, pectoralis major is definitely going to be a part of that picture. So next, we have a couple of muscles that are suggested to be assisters in the movement of shoulder flexion or perhaps weaker shoulder flexors, the first of which is the biceps brachii muscle. Now, the key way or the reason to remember this is because of the origins of this muscle. Of course, the biceps is commonly referred to as an elbow flexor and a supinator. But if we look at its origin points, we can see that it has a short head and a long head. The short head originates from the coracoid process of the scapula. And the long head originates from the supraglenoid tubercle, the tubercle just above the glenoid, also on the scapula. 
Therefore, you can imagine that when this muscle contracts, it will assist by bringing the fibres from the distal portion up towards the scapula, which is where it can assist in the movement of shoulder flexion. And the other muscle, which is really important to mention here as an assister in the movement, is coracobrachialis. So we can think of the name coraco brachialis and when you hear coraco you'll of course think of the coracoid process and that is where this muscle originates from the coracoid process before it inserts into the medial mid shaft of the humerus and therefore once again if we think about the way that this muscle is orientated going from a superior point to the humerus it means that when it contracts is going to assist in that movement of shoulder flexion so finally, there's a really important set of muscles that we need to mention in the context of shoulder flexion, but also for any shoulder movement. And that is, of course, the rotator cuff muscles, supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Now, do any of these muscles in isolation flex the shoulder? No, they don't. However, like all movements of the glenohumeral joint, these muscles act as a group to provide dynamic stability to the movement. So you can bet that whenever you need to flex your shoulder, these muscles are going to be contracting in order to assist the movement. And one of the reasons it's really important to say this is because if your patient has a rotator cuff tear, they may well struggle to flex their shoulder because those muscles cannot perform that really important dynamic stability role. So once again, do they in isolation flex the shoulder? No. Are they involved in the movement? Absolutely, because they act as a dynamic stabilizer of the shoulder during movement. Without a rotator cuff, you won't be able to flex your shoulder. So everyone, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button. It's the number one thing you can do to help the channel. Remember, we've also got brilliant resources on our Instagram account at Clinical Physio, be sure to give us a follow there. And we're also on TikTok at clinical.physio if you want to follow us there too. If you want more on anatomy, check out our membership platform, member.clinicalphysio.com with link in the description below. Part of being a premium or annual member is that you get access to our anatomy boot camps. We've got the shoulder anatomy boot camp, the hip anatomy boot camp, the knee, all the major joints that you can think of. We've got anatomy teachings on those, so you can follow us there. So thank you so much for watching. My name's Khalid. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.